Nice to see you all again. Uh, so the topic of the talk that I was given was mass loss, which is pretty wide open. So I decided I'm going to try to give a, a bit of an overview and also focus on a few specific things. Um, so I particularly want to mention why mass loss is interesting from the point of view of transients and the transient sky. And one is one that we've already been alluding to in the previous couple of talks, and that is that mass loss dominates the evolution of massive stars. And when I say that, I'm including uh, mass loss in binary systems, where mass is lost from a star to its companion. Um, but also, transient events that we observe are mass loss events, especially the non-supernova uh, transients are dramatic mass loss events that can, uh, can affect the subsequent evolution of the star. And also, in some cases, the non-supernova transients are a prelude to supernovae. And some of these supernovae do some pretty remarkable things when they crash into all that material that they had just ejected. And this gives us a particularly interesting clue about the final phases of nuclear burning that we really can't investigate observationally in many other ways. Uh, I listed several reviews here. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is from my more recent review, because that dealt a lot with transients and mass loss. Uh, and connections to supernovae, where, but there's a large literature on mass loss and stellar evolution, including uh, binaries. <clears throat> so we've seen some version of this already. There's this uh, diversity of observed types of supernovae. And this is, this is the result of a central theme in massive star evolution, which is whether or not a star is able to get rid of its hydrogen envelope and what does that, uh, what controls the physics of that, and that determines the different types of supernovae that we see. And so from my uh, perspective, studying mass loss and massive stars, the ones that are in the middle, that are sort of caught in this transition process, are some of the most interesting ones in, in terms of elucidating uh, what some of those key processes are. And that's uh, not just the peculiar things like 87A, but also type 2B supernovae, which are just on the verge of getting rid of all the hydrogen, and also the, the two ends, which have just gotten rid of a whole bunch of hydrogen. Uh, and also the, the type 1bns, which are perhaps a little bit past that, but also are showing some kind of eruptive mass loss. <clears throat> so in terms of how this actually happens, there aren't that many mechanisms that we have. There are basically four sort of families of way, ways that we can get rid, get rid of mass, to take mass off the star. Uh, and it, I would say, so this is where I'm going to offend a lot of people in my own community of massive star research, it's sort of perverse that... Uh, the, the mechanism that is the best developed theoretically and the best understood is the least important. Um, so we have hot star winds, line-driven winds from massive stars where ultraviolet photons give their momentum to iron atoms and then push material out. And that's a, a problem that you can investigate and we have, we have had a lot of attention devoted to this over the past three decades. And we have a pretty well-developed quantitative theory about predicting mass loss rates. And we've, able, we've been able to come to the conclusion that a lot of the observed mass loss rates need to be corrected for clumping. I'll talk about that in a second, and that those mass loss rates are actually quite a bit weaker than we used to think. And the net result of a lot of this effort is that hot star winds, the fast, steady winds during the O star main sequence, really are not very important in terms of the overall evolution of the star because the mass loss is too weak. And it turns out that that completely changes the picture of how we view stellar evolution. Uh, the next type of thing is a, a, also a steady wind, but it's a cool star wind, red supergiants. And those are not as well understood as hot stars, but we still have the basic idea that pulsations lift material, oh, I'm supposed to advance, there, uh, lift material up to a few stellar radii where dust forms, and then it's radiation pressure on dust that pushes this material away. But there's a huge amount of uncertainty in actually the efficiency of the dust formation, what the gas to dust mass ratio is. Uh, and, so we, and we do not have a quantitative predictive theory of mass loss for red supergiants. What we use in stellar evolution models are observed prescriptions. And those come from observing the infrared flux of red supergiants and adopting a gas to dust ratio and, and figuring out where that dust resides uh, in the atmosphere and the wind of the star. <clears throat> and so those are uh, even more uncertain than the O star winds. Uh, and there's a lot of indications that those have also been uh, overestimated, although the error bars are bigger. Um, there is also some indication that, uh, and I'll talk about this toward the end of the talk, that these mass loss rates for red supergiants may actually really ramp up uh, and get stronger and stronger in the very last phases of stellar evolution. Uh, next, we have these eruptions, episodic uh, Super Eddington winds and explosive mass loss from things like luminous blue variables. Um, now, this, here the theory is even worse. Uh, in that we know that they happen, but we really do not have 
at all a developed theory for understanding why they happen, what triggers them, and how much mass is lost. <clears throat> and also, it's, it's becoming, this is the importance, these are getting more important because these things we observe that sometimes in a single burst that lasts a few years, the star can shed 10 solar masses. And we don't have a theory for how that happens. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, binary evolution. And so here, it's not just the steady mass transfer, but there's also uh, common envelope ejection events, and there's violent mergers, which produce transient events and also cause dramatic mass loss uh, in short-lived punctuated phases in some cases. <clears throat> and it turns out that this one, though I've written in denial here, so obviously some people are not in, in denial. Uh, Selma just gave a whole talk about it. But there's this, this standard picture we have about how the role of mass loss in stellar evolution, and a, lo a lot of this has not yet percolated into the feedback prescriptions and a lot of other things that are the standard view of how mass loss dominates stellar evolution, and in fact not uh, percolated into our understanding of how they, these change with metallicity. Because all of these have different dependencies with metallicity. Understanding the metallicity dependence of the hot star winds is pretty straightforward, but it gets worse as we move down. For the cool star winds, we, we're not sure if it's really dominated. We don't know how it scales with metallicity because it depends on dust formation and that depends on the effectiveness of pulsations to lift material off the star, and the shocks create high density regions. Uh, the super Eddington winds and explosions are in principle uh, metallicity independent, because we're driving it with continuum electron scattering. But there may be some metallicity dependence in the evolution of the star that leads to that. Uh, and binaries don't care about metallicity unless you're talking about the, there is a radius of a star that is affected by uh, opacity. And then also the wind that happens after the mass transfer is over is also dependent on metallicity. But it, the, scale, the way this scales is not the same as what you might assume just for a line-driven wind. <clears throat> so this is a plot of what the mass loss rates actually are, at least what is put into a lot of stellar evolution codes. This is from my review paper. And basically you see everything goes up to the right. And so this is a plot of luminosity versus mass loss rate. And so things go up to the right because radiation drives material off a star. Uh, also, more ma massive stars that are more luminous have more mass to lose, and so when we have binary uh, mass transfer, if you're removing all of the hydrogen envelope, that involves more mass for more massive stars. Um, and so when you look at this plot, so the, the standard mass loss rate prescriptions are right in here. Uh, Fink et al. is the theoretical rates, and, the, and then Diager is what used to be used as the observational rates that were derived mostly from H alpha. And those are about the same. Um, then what we found recently is that these probably need to be reduced by about a factor of three, maybe more, but most people agree it's at least a factor of three. And then there's also issues with, there's this thing called the weak wind problem, which is that below 20 or 30 solar masses, the winds just fail as O stars, and, and there's basically no mass loss. So a star of 20 solar masses really doesn't lose any mass at all until maybe it becomes a red supergiant. And so what you can see here is that the red, not the red supergiant only, but all of the post-main sequence mass loss is much more important. That's really where we need to focus our attention in terms of trying to understand how stellar evolution works because those mass lo loss rates are much higher. Uh, the, the red supergiant mass loss rates, there's different prescriptions out there uh, and they're all, some people argue that they're all a bit on the high side. So even the normal red supergiant mass loss rates are quite a bit higher than a normal red supergiant like Betelgeuse, for example. The ones that are up here are sort of extreme red supergiants, uh, things that are cloaked in their own dust shells and self-obscured. Uh, and of course, there's wolf Eye stars and, and LBV ones. <clears throat> and then up at the top, these are the ones that the LBV giant eruptions are not even in any models at all, but they're by far the most important for the, for the very luminous stars. Uh, and they overlap quite a bit with the binary mass transfer rates. Uh, and in fact, you could, it may be the case that these giant LBV eruptions are a binary phenomenon and that they're kind of the same thing and that's why they end up in the same place uh, on this plot. I'm not sure what you're asking, but all right. <clears throat> all right, so the basic way this figures in, in stellar evolution is sort of a cartoon like this, where uh, over time, the star's mass is reduced. This is kind of the, this is the standard picture of evolution, and so the, the part of the star that's convective uh, depends on the luminosity of the star, and so as the star loses mass, uh, the convective core gets smaller. 
Uh, and so as the stars peeled away, we get to the later phases of the main sequence, and we begin to see the atmosphere of the star uh, that has enhancements of nitrogen and helium, because this material used to be in the core. The convective core has receded, but it has left behind mildly enhanced nuclear process material. And we do see that in O stars. Um, and then this, this can be enhanced if there's rotation uh, in a single star view. It turns out that that doesn't scale, it doesn't match what you expect from rotation rates, and that's a big issue in the massive star community. Uh, and then you, after peeling away all the mass, you end up with a helium uh, wolf rise star, a hydrogen-free wolf rise star. That's the, the pure helium core. And so that has led to this standard picture that you've all seen, I'm sure, from, from Hager's paper. Uh, that for a given metallicity, you reach uh, above a certain threshold luminosity, everything above that gets rid of the hydrogen envelope. And so that where that threshold sits depends on the mass loss rates that you adopt, and that threshold moves to higher mass as you move to lower metallicity because the, the mass loss rates depend on metallicity. And so there's this narrow transition region where you get the weird things the type 2Bs and the type 2Ls and the type 2Ns. Uh, and then above that, you get more and more stripped stars as the luminosity goes up. Um, <clears throat> so the problem with this is that if uh, those mass loss rates change, the picture changes. And the reason that, th that we have evidence that those mass loss rates have changed is because we've begun to understand a lot more about the clumping in the winds. And so when you use H-alpha or radio emission, these are things that depend on density squared. And if the emission is clumped, then you can get the same amount of luminosity in a much smaller amount of mass. And we've learned to infer that the winds are highly clumped by comparing resonance lines in the UV, which are dependent on density, to recombination lines in radio, which are dependent on density squared. And so it's very clear that O-star winds are clumped and that those mass loss rates have to come down. And so that changes the picture by moving this line to the right, or sort of to the right and up. Now that's a problem because it's, this is, I'll, I'll show you in a second uh, why that is in disagreement already with uh, supernova statistics. But here, this is so how we would modify that cartoon. This is the one I just showed you. And for, more, for uh, lower mass loss rates, we have very little mass loss on the main sequence with these lower rates. And you find that because the convective core doesn't shrink as much, you end the star's life with a much more massive helium core for a given initial mass. And we know right away that this is a problem because when we look around us, we never see wolf rise stars that are that massive, hydrogen-free wolf rise stars. We, this is a, a plot of masses measured in, uh, f by uh, doing spectral fits to the atmosphere, and then this is measured in binary systems, and we have two different, really, well, three different families of wolf rise stars. There's WN and WC, but then there's these things called WNH stars, which still have hydrogen. And really what they are are O stars that have strong winds. So they have wolf like features in the winds. So all of the really massive wolf stars have hydrogen. The ones that don't have any hydrogen left are all 25 solar masses or less. We never see any helium cores that are very, uh, very massive. Uh, also, uh, ejecta masses of stripped envelope supernovae are all very small, a few solar masses, not 10 or 20 or 30 solar masses, with the possible exception of some of the broad line one sees. Um, so then there's this picture, which people have, El Selma already talked about this a bit, and the key point I wanted to make is that when you look at um, the fraction of stripped envelope supernovae in this standard single star picture, the fraction is already too high. Stars, you, you have to dig down into the IMF much lower than the transition above which you would get wolf rise stars in a single star picture. If some of these more massive stars collapse to a black hole and don't make a supernova, that makes the problem worse. Uh, if you include the type 2Bs with the stripped envelope supernovae, it makes the problem even worse. Uh, and really the picture that you favor instead is one where the stripped envelope supernovae are divided equally among masses roughly, uh, or more equally than here. Uh, we can't rule out that some stripped envelope supernovae come from single stars, but the vast majority seem to come from lower mass uh, stars that have lost their hydro envelope in a binary. And that's, again, consistent with uh, the very low ejecta masses that you get uh, from looking at the light curves of stripped envelope supernovae. <clears throat> There's not, as Selma pointed out, the fraction that she expects from starting with the observed binary statistics, you predict a certain fraction, and that's about the same as what's observed, which means there isn't a lot of room left to have single stars making stripped envelope supernovae, maybe a few percent. Uh, but not much more than that. All right. 
Um, there's another issue that's actually really interesting. It's, it gets to the, these type 2b supernovae. So this is from the PTF survey. Uh, Yair Arkavi wrote this paper um, showing that uh, the type 2b supernovae are significantly more common when you move to dwarf galaxies with lower metallicity. Uh, and that directly contradicts expectations from this sort of picture because the type 2b's are a narrow transition region as you go toward higher mass loss, right? And as, if you go to lower metallicity, because the IMF goes down, you would expect fewer type 2b's at lower metallicity, not more. Uh, and there's a much larger fraction. So this, the way you get this naturally in a binary scenario is that at lower metallicity, the mass transfer removes almost all the hydrogen envelope and leaves a little bit of hydrogen. And after that, it's the metallicity-dependent wind that removes the rest. And so that is weaker at low metallicity. So this is, and that combined with the very low, the fact that type 2b supernovae have low masses, uh, ejecta masses of only a couple solar masses, where you've got the entire, you haven't eaten down into the helium core yet, means that their helium cores are small. All right, so now I want to move on and talk a little bit about some of the transient events. So historically, these were always talked about as LBVs, but more recent surveys have begun to find things that, are not, that don't seem to fit our standard picture of what LBVs are. And in fact, we don't even know what LBVs really are. They're eruptions. We see uh, objects in our galaxy that have been called LBVs, and there's a couple that have had historical eruptions. And then we see transients in other galaxies that look similar in a lot of ways. Um, but we're not really sure what they are. Um, we can try to characterize their uh, peak luminosities and their total radiated energy and their time scales and their expansion speeds and kinetic energies. Uh, and they span a wide range uh, of energy. Up to, you know, they start getting near supernovae, sort of weak supernovae or, uh, uh, you know, the boundary of maybe what core collapse supernovae do. Um, their radiated energies actually compete with, with some normal supernovae and then they go pretty far down as well. Um, and in a lot of these, the ratio, this is important, I think, the ratio of uh, radiated energy, let me say it the right way I got it written here, the ratio of kinetic energy to radiated energy is greater than one. That suggests a shock rather than a radiation-driven wind. At least line-driven winds are very, very inefficient. Usually the radiated energy is much greater than the, than the wind mechanical energy. When you've got this sort of scenario, when that number gets close to one or significantly exceeds one, you're talking about very optically thick winds driven by a uh, runaway super Eddington mass loss or a shock wave. Um, so we really don't know what drives these things though. There are a lot of ideas, uh, but not a lot of uh, constraints that actually help us choose one of these ideas. Um, so the, the old picture was always that there's some kind of in, these strange mode instabilities or different kinds of instabilities in the envelope of the star. And those might help uh, iron opacity instabilities, things like that, and those might help work for, those might work for some of the normal LBV variations, but the giant eruptions that eject many solar masses of material, uh, these instabilities occur too far out in the envelope. There's not enough mass above them to eject, and there's not enough thermal energy in the envelope to power the outburst. So those are ruled out, at least for the, the, the giant eruptions that we observe in other galaxies. Um, Continuum-driven super Eddington winds have been a natural idea for a long time, uh, and you can invoke them to, get, that's the only way to get the material off the star if it's radiatively driven. The caveat there is it's not really a model for the trigger. We don't know, you have to have something dump energy into the envelope and then it comes out as a super Eddington wind and drives the mass loss, but what actually makes that happen is not uh, part of that model. This is what happens after. Um, so then the, for a long time there's been these pulsational pair instability events and in a lot of ways those are really interesting because they provide they're the only model that was ever predicted that can actually do what something like Eta Carina did, eject 10 solar masses with 10 to the 50 ergs. Uh, the problem with these is that we expect them in most cases to be shortly before the supernova, shortly before core collapse. And a lot of LBVs are surrounded by 20 solar mass shells that are 20,000 years old. Um, so this is actually a good model for some of the pre-supernova outbursts that cause type 2N supernovae, but not for the a lot of the LBV eruptions. Um, well, so, th so there's a caveat that in some cases you can have a long time delay, right? But in, that's unusual, right? That's a, a narrow range of parameter space. No? Okay, well, good, if that may... Uh... Not 20,000, but 3,000 years. Okay, okay, that's, that's good news. Okay, well, we'll hear about that tomorrow. That's good. Um, 
Um, but then there's maybe, maybe a more generic version of this, which is some kind of uh, unstable mixing and uh, uh, unsteady fusion events that can maybe power some kind of energy, put energy deposition into the, into the envelope. Um, some people have suggested that electron capture supernovae, the lower energy terminal explosions of uh, degenerate cores might power some of these extragalactic transients that look like uh, supernova imposters. And then there's a whole family of sort of what I would call violent binary interaction, things like mergers and collisions. Um, the trick with these is that, that you still need to get a transient event. And what you need for that maybe is either an eccentric orbit uh, or you need some change in the primary star. Something has to initiate a, tra a runaway mass loss that wasn't happening before because we see these transients turn on and they weren't doing it 10 years ago. Um, so you still need some kind of changes, so it may be a combination of, of more than one of these working together. We, uh, maybe I'll skip to this, we see some examples in other galaxies that seem to fit the bill for a merger. Um, this is one that we recently published, um, where it had a complex sort of multi-peak light curve and got very red at the end, and actually it stayed very luminous in the IR. This is a source that we found in Monsi's uh, infrared survey. It, the luminosity continued at about the same luminosity, and it cannot be an infrared echo, it's actually a source that seemed to survive this outburst at the same or higher luminosity, but embedded in a dust shell. Um, and it behaved the same, except more extreme, than some of these well-known things in our galaxy, like V838MON uh, and V1309SCO, which is the one thing that really was a merger, for sure, because we saw the merger happen. Um, people often talk about Adakar as maybe being a merger, and I actually like this idea, because it's a great way to get the amount of energy. The problem with Adakar is it's more complicated than just a binary merger because it has done this before. So I have a grad student who's been analyzing the proper motions of all this crud around Adakar that's expanding at hundreds of kilometers per second, and it seems to fall into at least three different eruptions that occurred in the 1250s, in the 1550s, and then in the early part of the 1800s. And we have, this is over 20-some uh, years of HST data, and there's no deceleration. So this is, these are, this is ballistic motion. So there's at least three eruptions separated by 300 years. And each of them ejected several solar masses of material. Uh, and it's very, very, very nitrogen rich. All of it is nuclear processed material. And a lot of that stuff, some of the older stuff, is actually outside the X-ray shell that you see with Chandra. So it's not it's decelerating and emitting X-rays. So it's an indication that these things do this over and over again. So a, a merger alone isn't gonna do it. There must be some kind of repeating collision or something. All right, last thing, uh, the type 2N supernovae. So many of you have seen this kind of thing before. Basically, we have a shock running into some pre-supernova mass loss, and from the luminosity in the light curve and from observed properties in the spectrum, you can infer the pre-shock wind speed. You can infer the, the speed at which the supernova blast wave is expanding, as long as you wait until the later times when you're not seeing the, the scattering wings. Uh, and then from the luminosity, you can infer the mass loss rate. And the, the punchline is that the mass loss rates for a lot of these type 2N supernovae are huge. Uh, upwards of a percent of a solar mass per year or more. And that's not something you can get from normal stellar winds. Um, and so there's, there turns out there's a wide diversity, a huge range of luminosity in these type 2N supernovae, um, which can be explained either by a range of mass loss rates beforehand. In the, if you're imagining a spherical picture, you can also get a range of luminosity simply by changing the geometry, by changing the geometric covering factor a disk, for example, might intercept only 10% of the kinetic energy of the explosion and therefore can only convert some fraction of that into light and therefore make a lower luminosity supernova. To get the bigger ones, the higher luminosity ones, you either need uh, a spherical shell with a lot of mass or you need a more energetic explosion. But you don't necessarily need that. You can explain, um, you don't necessarily need more energy from the supernova itself. You can explain it with the diversity of CSM. And so if you plot a lot of these on, on this plot, which is uh, mass loss rate versus expansion speed, I've been showing this for a long time when I go to meetings, but I finally put it in a paper, sort of it's in a chapter I'm writing for this handbook of supernovae that many of you are writing a chapter for. Um, this basically, the, the dashed and the solid line are, are lines of constant wind density. And down here are all of the normal winds, the steady winds that we have from massive stars from that plot I showed you before. And these lines represent the wind density you need. This one is for the circumstellar interaction to compete with a normal type two plateau supernova. And this one is to enhance the luminosity of the supernova and make it brighter. So these are sort of like the minimum 
uh, wind densities you need to make a type 2N, basically. And all of the ones, a lot of the type 2Ns are way above this, and the only, th the only things that have mass loss rates that high are LBV giant eruptions or mass transfer uh, rates. Now, down at the bottom end, there are some of these red supergiants that have rates that get up there, okay? Um, but, the, but these are very, very extreme red supergiants, things that have uh, really raging winds that are only on for a short amount of time. Uh, maybe I'll skip over this, except that to say we have seen examples where the progenitor looks like an LBV. We've even detected pre-supernova eruptions, but I wanted to mention the caveat that that doesn't exclude red supergiants because, that, that are self-obscured because the bright things are easier to see. There may be dusty, obscured red supergiants. Um, and so the, the reason this is all interesting because it hints that there's something going on, right, in the last phases of nuclear burning in the core of the star that we don't yet understand. Something is becoming unstable and the star is warning us that it's going to explode. Uh, and there are several ideas now that are related mostly to the neon and oxygen burning phases. Um, the star could either trigger mass loss through the, the wave propagation that uh, Elliot has talked about, or maybe it, it swells up and starts interacting with a companion, uh, or there's the pulsational parent stability. Um, but then what I wanted to end with is that there's actually a family of these type 2 Ns. Some of them have mass loss you know, in the, that seem to have gone on the, a year before the supernova. But there's a bunch that were raging for for thousands of years before the supernova. So this is a plot of H alpha versus time, and these guys, this is supernova 1988Z, which if you've looked at, if you've heard of that one, it's still going. It's still very luminous in H alpha. And if you add up what, the, the mass loss rate that's implied is something like 10 to the minus three solar masses per year going for 10,000 years before the supernova. So this is like the most extreme red supergiant mass loss rate known going for a really long time. And if you integrate the mass, it's tens of solar masses of material, which is really an extreme case. Now, since this was going on for thousands of years, neon and oxygen burning aren't going to cut it for that kind of time scale. So something else is going on. And one possibility is this, this uh, regime where at the very top of the red supergiant phase, as things go up the red supergiant branch, they've shed a lot of mass, and so the luminosity to mass ratio goes up, and the stars become unstable, and they start driving crazy winds. And we actually see when we look at red supergiant clusters that the ones at the tip are the ones that are enshrouded by dust and have OH masers and stuff like that. So there is actually uh, some evidence for this, but the time scales from observations are still poorly constrained. All right, so this is my last, uh, my summary slide. I guess I'll just leave that up since I'm over time. All right, thanks. Do we know, do we know, or is there evidence that mass loss is deterministic? In other words, it's a single-valued function, let's stick to single stars, that it's a single-valued function of the zero-age mass. Say that again. Do we know, or do we have reason to doubt, that mass loss is deterministic? In other words, that it's a single-valued function of the zero-age mass. Or in other words, could two stars born with the same mass and same composition have widely diverging mass loss histories? Um. There's, we, well, all we have are observational estimates. We go out and measure mass loss rates of O stars, and you can, in, you can make some estimate of that based on the scatter, and the scatter isn't that big. The scatter is sort of a factor of two-ish. If you, if you make all the assumptions in deriving the mass loss rate, um, the biggest uncertainty there is actually knowing ahead of time what the age of the star is. Right, so you might be wrong in thinking that stars are the same age, because two stars with the same initial mass will have a different mass loss rate after a million years or two million years. Because the mass loss rate also depends on the mass of the star. Uh, so as you shed mass, it becomes easier to shed mass because you get closer to the Eddington limit. Are, are there any significant constraints on the asphericity of the ejection and polarization, for example, other things that could inform the study of the mechanisms? Yeah. So. Um, for the galact there are objects in our galaxy with circumstellar shells, and basically none of them are spherical, or very few of them are spherical. Uh, and the ones that are the most interesting are the youngest ones that are still in free expansion, and those are always highly aspherical. You start seeing things that are egg-shaped or more spherical when they get much older, but that, you expect that as the, the bubble gets inflated. Um, from extragalactic transients, there has not been a lot of work done on spectral polarimetry, but we're trying, we're starting to do that. So there's Supernova 2009 IP, which was this famous one that had a bunch of eruptions beforehand, it appeared that the, 
when, when the light was dominated by the supernova, the polarization vector was one way, and when the light became dominated by circumstellar interaction, it was orthogonal. The polarization vectors were orthogonal, suggesting that the, you had a disk, right, when the circumstellar interaction happened. So yeah, it does, there does seem to be some sign of asphericity, and I think that's very important. For some of the ones where we see examples where the, you see a type 2n signature right away, this is something Avishai will talk about. Where is he? Uh, where the, the, the circumstellar interaction signatures in the spectrum disappear after a couple of days. And that may be because you have a disk which is then just completely overrun and enveloped uh, by the expanding supernova flows here. And then, you, then the, the signatures of circumstellar interaction come back again once the, once the photosphere recedes and expose this stuff. And then you often see double horn profiles that look like a torus or something. So there's a lot of evidence, a lot of tentative evidence for these here, so yeah. Ask you a quick question on the weak wind uh, yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. That's something that we've stumbled upon uh, independently uh, in the context of looking for low luminosity X ray binaries. And we've found one that may have a black hole companion to, a, to an O star. And the thing that makes it all work is precisely that weak wind. Yeah, so the, the tentative explanation for that yeah. that people usually talk about is that. What happens is when the mass loss rates get fairly low, um, it becomes hard for the wind to cool. And so sh shocks within the wind are continually heating it, and if it cools, it stays in equilibrium. But if the density is low, the emissivity goes down and the, the wind can stay hot. And then you don't see uh, the, the typical resonance lines in the UV that you use to, to measure a mass loss rate, and so you can maybe underestimate the mass loss rate. That's part of the discussion, but people have tried to correct for that. Um, but it could be the ionization actually the higher ionization, because it's failing to cool, actually hurts the ability to drive the wind, uh, because you don't have the lines you usually push on.